Uh, my name is Kiri Tunks. I'm a long time uh, women's rights activist and trade union activist. Um, and I'm also one of the co-founders of Women's Place UK. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Women's Place UK was formed in 2017 to ensure that women's voices were heard in the consultation around the GRA, the proposals to change the GRA. And we were really determined to ensure that there was a space that women uh, could be heard, that they were part of the debate that was happening and to make sure that any policy or law that was being made was not being made without taking into the account the perspectives of as many people as possible because we think that that is how you make good law. Um, so just to be very clear, Women's Place UK is for the human rights of everybody and we are against the discrimination, harassment and abuse of anybody. It's really that simple for us. But ours is first and foremost a women's rights campaign. We have a manifesto of demands which make clear what our principles um, and campaign demands are. And I'm sure um, somebody will post a link to that uh, manifesto in the chat. We have agreed five resolutions um, or wants as we call them, uh, which build on the initial demands we made as part of our GRA campaign. And they, these are the demands. Women have the right to self-organize. We want an end to violence against women and girls. Nothing about us without us, which I think is very apt for this evening's discussion. The law must work for women, as is that, um, and sex matters. Now, all of those things drive everything we do. We've held 26 public meetings. We've had one conference, uh, which uh, about a thousand people attended just before the first lockdown. And during lockdown, we have organized seven webinars. So this is our eighth webinar. We believe that only by hearing a range of views can we develop a deeper understanding of the concerns women have and come to progressive resolutions for everybody. So on that note, I'm going to welcome you to Women's Place is holding NGOs to account in what frankly has been quite a week for at least one NGO. Um, as organisation after organisation withdraws from the Stonewall Diversity Champion Scheme, it is clear that there is broad dissatisfaction and real concerns about its activities and its behaviours. We at Women's Place have long expressed our concerns at Stonewall's failure to listen to the concerns of women, especially lesbians, and to reject all attempts at dialogue. Any organisation serious about equality must want to foster good relations between all protected characteristics. And yet Stonewall has only ever put up barriers to any such dialogue at the same time as acting against the rights of many women. So let's not forget that Stonewall, along with Scottish Trans Alliance and Gendered Intelligence have been lobbying for the removal of the single sex exemptions from the Equality Act. It's 60 years since the formation of Amnesty. And if you look at the principles that they were founded on, they talk about being a global community of human rights defenders. They talk about international solidarity, effective action, global coverage, indivisibility of human rights, impartiality and independence, democracy and mutual respect. And yet many feel that Amnesty's concern for human rights doesn't stretch that far when it comes to women's rights. We've also seen recently that the EHRC has released a, a human rights tracker, which shows how far this country has come in terms of uh, human rights in this country. And in particular, there, um, it shows how much there is still to do on a whole range of human rights issues, especially for women. So it seems a good time to ask really, are the NGOs that claim to improve our rights fit for purpose or have they lost their way? What are NGOs doing for human rights? What are they doing right? And what are they doing wrong? What can be done to make NGOs accountable for women? And what can, they, what can be done to make them work for women? Is the NGO model intrinsically unworkable and do we need a whole new think about how we organize for human rights? Each of our speakers will talk for about 15 minutes and then we'll take some questions. We have got some questions that we received in advance of the meeting, but if you've got a question, please pop it into the Q&A function and we will uh, do our best to sort and answer as many of those questions. The chat is open, please keep it respectful. We do reserve the right to remove anybody who can't do that. Um, we are live tweeting at Women's Rights for Human Rights. I've said about the recording, it's only the panelists that are being recording. So I'm going to, without further ado, welcome our three speakers. We're very pleased tonight that we have Isolt White, Gita Sagal, and Kaisa Ekis Ekman. I'm going to give an introduction for each of those people just before they speak. Um, so um, it gives me great pleasure to ask Esalt White to kick off this evening. Um, just a little introduction for Esalt. She's an independent director, executive coach, management consultant, and psychotherapist. Her letter to the Irish Times about amnesty and freedom of conscience defends 
quote, legitimate representation to people of conscience. Isolt, we're really glad to have you here this evening. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here, delighted to talk about the fact that women's rights are human rights and about the problems of um, attempting to hold NGs, NGOs to account and particularly the problems of attempting to hold a global human, human rights organization to account, such as Amnesty. Um, uh, I just wanted to say as I kick off that I'm wearing some homicidal haberdashery tonight in a uh, sisterhood with Marion, whose human rights are being attacked in Scotland, along with many of our sisters in Scotland. Um, in framing this in the 15 minutes and to create space for conversation, I thought I would just try and explain how I attempted to hold amnesty to account and why I attempted to hold them to account. Um, and in doing that, I also used personal experience I had had previously of holding an NGO to account in my own life when I discovered it's really difficult to hold NGOs to account. And also uh, from my own involvement in NGOs at, at board level. So really just a sort of a general understanding of NGOs. So in fact, uh, the reason that I had even a slight chance of holding Amnesty to account when they sent a letter or when they published promoted, signed, published, promoted a letter in Ireland last November that demanded the removal of legitimate representation uh, in the media and in government. So when they published that letter, I, I responded to it. And just really through an accident of birth, I was in a unique position to attempt to hold them to account. So just to quickly explain that, my grandfather, Sean McBride, uh, was co-founder co of Amnesty and chairman of Amnesty up until 1975. So Amnesty were just part of my, my life growing up. We, you know, a lot of the things were run from my grandparents' house. We used to send the Christmas cards. Um, Amnesty was really important to my grandfather. He, you know, it, it was sort of his, the culmination of his life's work really. And the heritage he had came from his mother, Maud Gawne McBride, who had first started fighting for prisoners, political prisoners, back in 1890 when an Irish man, Michael David, was held in Portland Prison in the UK. And she herself was later arrested and held in Holloway Prison. And then finally, in the Irish Free State, she was also held for peaceful protest uh, in the Irish Free State. So my family had a really strong understanding of the need for protecting prisoners of conscience. And when Amnesty was started, it had a very tight remit, which was to work for the rights of prisoners of conscience, people who had been imprisoned, tortured or executed because their opinions or their religion were unacceptable to their government. And it didn't matter. It, it wasn't about judging their opinions or their religion. Uh, it was only that they shouldn't be pun punished because their opinions were held from a place of conscience. And using that model, which was a very tight remit, Amnesty was able to very successfully build a global human rights brand. But uh, as, as other human rights brands sort of came in and they were no longer the lone gatekeeper, and also as their membership expanded, there was demands for them to sort of shore up their legitimacy by adopting an increasing number and, and widening range of rights issues, civil society issues. So um, reproductive rights, that they famously took some time but decided to campaign for the rights of sex workers as workers, and now also for transgender uh, identity, for gender identity rights. And this has created some problems with for them as a human rights organization, and that was seen very clearly at the time of um, Navalny, because originally they adopted him as a prisoner of conscience, but then under a concerted propaganda campaign by the Russian government, they de-adopted him. I don't know what the opposite of adopt is, but they de-adopted him because apparently he had said hate speech and, and they can no longer just adopt people on conscience. You have to fit in with this broad range of their so-called human rights campaigns. They have since again adopted him. So they're, they're confused as an organization, I think is the best we could say. So what happened last November was that the Transgender Equality Network of Ireland published a letter and Amnesty International signed and promoted it along with 
um, 27 other NGOs, um, and that will be put up on the chat if you want a link to look at it. And I don't want to spend too much time on it. People can go and read it later. But the key things to understand about the letter is a three page letter kind of poorly written, I would say, personally, and it, it kind of used the techniques of authoritarian propaganda. So it defined a threat from the outside that was attacking this very beleaguered community, the transgender community. And that threat came from a variety of people who were bigots, they were individuals, new grassroots organizations, outsiders and foreigners. But a key part of the letter was that it named none of these things. So we have to rely on all of these organizations and amnesty to believe that these people existed and that they would name them as they came up, I suppose. Uh, so we had no way of going and checking what they were talking about. And then finally, they made a demand for censorship. And so the, the key message was, we call on media and politicians to no longer provide legitimate representation for those that share bigoted beliefs that are aligned with far right ideologies. No mention of what the supposed far right ideologies. So it took some time to understand the letter. I read it about 10 times in dismay because of how illiberal and anti-democratic it was. But I finally discovered the sentence in there that let me know what a far right ideology was. And that was that sex is a spectrum. Sex and gender are both spectrums. Um, so wherever you stand within in this whole issue, it is very controversial to suggest that saying that biological sex is binary and material and immutable. That's not a far right ideology. I mean, that's just like a really ridiculous statement. And, you know, my response to the letter fundamentally, fundamentally came from the attack on human rights, because in this letter, there was basically uh, three sets of human rights that were being absolutely attacked. Freedom of expression, freedom of association. There was an attempt to prevent, you know, to, to demand that government not allow grassroots organizations uh, get going. And there was an attack on basic, basic political representation. And on every level, as, as a member of a democracy, those things are just completely apparent to me. And it actually wouldn't matter who was being defended in that way, I would still want to fight this letter. Now, like I say, I, 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 sorry, I was lucky in attempting to do that because I had this position through this birthright that, that gave me some currency in, 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 in attacking the letter, so to speak. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how do you start to think about even holding NGOs to account? And my answer and response would be, it is extremely, extremely difficult to do um, for a number of reasons. One is the relationship between NGOs and the public. So as members of the public, <laughs> we tend to want to do good things in society, but a lot of us are busy and we don't necessarily have a lot of time. So we kind of hand over the responsibility for doing good in society to NGOs. And, and then NGOs like to in turn sort of court us because we're a part of their fundraising. And it takes a really gross breach of trust by an NGO for the public to really respond. And even then, you know, within a year or two, many of them will recover. So uh, it's really, really difficult. Then the other issue is for national NGOs, as opposed to transnational NGOs, there's a symb symbiotic relationship between the NGOs and government. Um, where the NGOs tend to provide sort of cheap service delivery and in turn government depends on them. So the government is invested in the NGOs, the NGOs are invested in government and NGOs aren't able to be fully independent critics. And those organizations that sign the amnesty letter are all grouped together, they campaign together, they walk in lockstep uh, and government is happy to deal with them because it, it just gives them a small number of people to deal with. So when you try to hold an NGO to account, um, you are against the NGO, <laughs> the public, and the government. <laughs> so it's never going to be an easy situation. So in thinking about holding an NGO to account, I suppose the first thing you have to do is look for a chink in that armor. And the ways to think about that is, have they departed from their stated purpose? But that really only works if they're regulated. So for instance, 
Amnesty being transnational is not subject to any regulations uh, um, nationally in Ireland. It's a private company, essentially. Um, I suppose the other thing you could do is if they've done something illegal, particularly something fiduciary, you can always hold them to account. Or if they've done something that puts them in conflict with a major funding source. So either it's a branding headache or in some way they don't fulfill an SLA they have with a funder. Um, but one thing I think that, you know, always have to consider when you're trying to hold an NGO to account that it should never be perceived as an attack on the beneficiaries of the NGO. And you want to take a very strategic, analytic, method, method, methodical kind of process in thinking about it. So when I looked at the amnesty situation, I realized I had an opportunity to hold them to account on some level because of my background and because they had moved away from fundamental human rights issues that most amnesty members are concerned about. So I attacked them on the freedom of expression, particularly the freedom of expression. And I started using the chilling effect hashtag. Um, one thing to understand that when you try to, <laughs> when you try to hold an NGO to account, they will probably attack you with everything they have. So you really want to prepare yourself emotionally and mentally for that and really, um, look after your own public image and be prepared to fight back hard. And I, I think a really good example of that is the way Stonewall attacked Alison. Uh, NGOs will happily scapegoat and victimize anybody who gets in their way. And it's not necessarily the individuals in the NGO, it's the NGO as a systemic entity. Um, Thankfully, Alison is successfully fighting back, but not everybody ends up having the wherewithal to do that. So I think it's really, really important when you consider uh, if you are going to attack an NGO, that you remember not to attack the demographic they're supporting. So, I mean, I wouldn't attack transgender people anyway. I, you know, they have been part of my community, but the fact that I was able to shift the dialogue completely pivoted from transgender issues just onto freedom of expression issues, meant that many people in Ireland who would not never have spoken up or got involved if it was about transgender rights actually were interested, read the stuff, and some got involved. And so there was a variety of people who stood up with me and said uh, what Amnesty was doing was wrong. And that did create some amount of a branding issue for Amnesty. And so they came back and attacked us really quite strongly and uh, accused me of, of misrepresentation and attacking their human rights campaigns and all sorts of stuff. Um, but anyway, I was successful in significantly drawing attention to an issue with them. Uh, the next thing I suppose is to look at uh, what can you actually do then? And, you know, people were asking me, have they got in touch with you? No, of course they wouldn't get in touch with me. You know, can you form a complaint? It's very difficult to form a complaint against an organization like Amnesty, because like I say, you've nothing to hold them account to. I have formed a complaint. I have sent it in formally to the board of Amnesty Ireland. I'm still awaiting a response from them. And uh, I suppose you think about those things strategically. Um, no matter what the response is, I can still use the complaint to, to go further. Um, and that's all just something that, that will go on slowly in the background. Um, I think in general, you know, mostly we're trying to hold more national NGOs to account. And I think Stonewall, what's happened with Stonewall is a really brilliant uh, example of that. And what's made it possible to hold Stonewall to account is they've essentially been breaking the law, right? Their guidance, their guidance is not fit for purpose with the law. So that gives a real angle for going in and attacking. But as, you, as we've all seen, that has been incredibly slow process, uh, difficult to gain traction. And again, that's because the public like their NGOs, you know, they don't really want to, they don't really want to attack an NGO. So you're always up against that. And I suppose I think in, in the Stonewall situation in the UK, it's probably lucky that that Conservatives are in government because I don't think Labour would have uh, taken the position that Liz Truss has taken. 
And, and I suppose then you use all the other tools that are available to you. So when it's a national NGO that works with government, you use FOIs, you track down funding, you track down breaches of SLAs, and you try and work on all of those things. And I think this campaign with Stonewall is how we need to be thinking about holding NGOs to account. And I think NGOs are sort of past their sell by date in many ways. You know, they're very corporatized. It's this constant uh, issue around how they're very focused on getting their next piece of funding rather than maybe thinking uh, on a principled level about the people they're representing. And I think there are real models emerging now of, of like what's happened in the UK of new loosely distributed networks of people uh, doing specific fundraising for specific targets that they can campaign on and really paying attention to where there is a strong energy, a focus and some kind of natural momentum. And I think that holding NGOs to account, it really involves both creating new, new grassroots organizations like Women's Place, um, like LGB Alliance, and uh, also finding, finding targets that, that can be campaigned on. So will I be successful in holding Amnesty to account as a global human rights organization? No, no. So the other thing you need to do is just think really strategically about what you're trying to do. So I've been able to use that uh, very successfully as a tool to educate people in Ireland to open a bit of a, a space or a wedge that other people can start talking about the issues and to draw attention to the, this constant narrowing of acceptable speech. And there are still many people our age, my age in the world who care about freedom of expression, even though that's not something that tends to be something that younger people care significantly about. Uh, but I think I think it's about also thinking that everything you do is, is everything you do is an opportunity to do something. Uh, so every time you speak up, it's an opportunity to make a point to to provide information, to provide links to things that people who lurk on Twitter and other places like that um, uh, see. And you find that, that, that in doing so, it's much easier than you think to speak up. It's worth doing. And people support you in ways that are oblique. They don't necessarily come out and say, way go easel to look at what you're doing because nobody in Ireland has really done that apart from some women and <laughs> um, uh, but not the establishment at all and, and the Irish Times they took about three days to decide to publish my letter and they they had no excuse not to publish it because it was so um it was so clear and uh, carefully worded that there was no reason on this earth that they shouldn't publish it but they sat on it for three full days before they published it thinking about it uh, and so that's uh, so that's really it. Just keep speaking up and think about what you want to say and how you want to do it. So thank you. Esau, thank you so much. That is such a brilliant um, introduction to the topic. And I've written so many notes already, so many interesting things you've said. I know Ali's been busy um, posting in the chat uh, links and comments and things. Uh, absolutely fantastic start to our event tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move on um, now to our second speaker. There will be time to put questions, hopefully, to Isil, Gita and Kaisa. But I'm going to move on now to our second speaker tonight. Our second speaker is Gita Segal. Um, and for I'm sure uh, many of you know Gita already. She's a very well-known activist and thinker. And we're very honoured to have her here tonight as well. Um, she's a writer and journalist on issues of feminism, fundamentalism and racism. She was head of the gender unit in Amnesty uh, International and was forced out when she went public with her concerns regarding their promotion of a pro-jihad campaigner as a human rights defender. Gita is also a documentary films director and a women's rights and human rights activist. Gita, you are very welcome here this evening. Thank you, Kiri, and thank you, Woman's Place, for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and also uh, extremely nervous, but I'll get right into it because I know you want to stick to time. Um, and I know that lots of people actually have, have no clue what this is all about and what I'm going to speak about. So most of what I'm going to say is explaining what happened 
11 years ago, I was suspended from Amnesty International for talking to the Sunday Times. And a few months later, in spite of making headline news all over the world and generating petitions in my defense, signed by feminists and human rights defenders everywhere, I was forced out of the organization. When I was suspended, I issued a statement. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when a great organization must ask, if it lies to itself, can it demand the truth of others? But in defending this torture standard, one of the strongest and most embedded in international human rights law, Amnesty International has sanitized the history of the ex-Guantanamo detainee Muazim Beg and completely failed to recognize the nature of his organization, Cage Prisoners. Cage Prisoners, now called Cage, is still around. Its best known figure, Muazim Beg, who I'd complained about, has long been a fixture in progressive and human rights circles. In spite of a mountain of evidence about his views, drawn from his own autobiography, not material collected under torture. In his, uh, or in his memoir, he, could, he, he writes that he considered Afghanistan under the Taliban a wonderful state and full of old time values and has taken his family to live there. Information on the cage prisoners website revealed that they promoted key Al Qaeda ideologues as prisoners of belief. In other words, as men being held like amnesty prisoners of conscience solely for their views, not their violent actions or their incitement to violence. About five years after I left Amnesty International, during the height of the ISIS ascendancy across Iraq and Syria, a notorious ISIS executioner known as Jihadi John was unmasked as a British man, Mohammed Mwazi. It turned out he'd been close to Cage, who held a press conference to announce this fact. Now, Mwazi was not the first terrorist to have been associated with Cage, but he was the first whom Asim Qureshi, one of the senior Cage figures, declared to be a beautiful young man in front of the world's television cameras. And he did this after there was video evidence of the horrific executions that Mwazi had co conducted. Suddenly, there was renewed interest in Amnesty International's relationship with Cage, and Amnesty had to shuffle awkwardly away from their partners. The issue I raised was about the ethical conduct of my own organization and the terms on which it chose and engaged with internal external partners. It was my attempt to hold Amnesty International to account. And it succeeded to the extent that Amnesty was thoroughly exposed through media interviews and press attention. The greatest success though went almost unnoticed. And that was the admission by acting Secretary General Claudio, Claudio Cordone that defensive jihad, defensive jihad is not antithetical to human rights. Now, what does this double negative mean? Defensive jihad, as Beg had explained, is seen by, by Islamists as the individual duty of every Muslim. It is not, as some might like to frame it, an Islamic version of a liberation struggle. It is about the killing of all those who do not conform of unbelievers, dissidents, women, minorities, and most especially women in minorities. Defense's jihad is a theory that justified mass rape, sexual slavery, and the burning of Yazidi women. Six years on, the on the third, uh, in fact, six years ago on the 3rd of June, ISIS burnt 19 Yazidi girls to death in Mosul. But nowhere in the numerous legal cases brought by American organizations such as the Center for Constitutional Rights or the ACLU in their public advocacy for terror suspects, will you find an examination of incitement to kill by Al-Qaeda figures? Anwar al a senior Al-Qaeda ideologue, for instance, said, hatred of the kuffar, that's unbelievers, is a central element of our military creed. While the CCR challenged the right-wing talk show host, Glenn Beck, about incitement to gay hatred, they defended Orlaki as an incendiary preacher who was protected by the First Amendment. I, I have links to, uh, to with more information on these that should come up in the uh, chat. I have little time to elaborate these quite complex matters. So let me tell, let me just say that the studied ignorance of violent incitement 
is a key part of the poisoned process of policymaking. Ignorance is not accidental, but carefully nurtured. And it did not start with the war on terror. In the past, human rights organizations had focused their demands on the state and tended to ignore atrocities committed by so-called non-state actors. That meant that a great deal of violence directed at, at civilians and particularly women was not considered suitable for investigation. And non-state actors, which is a huge umbrella human rights term, um, in the community and family could be husbands, fathers, village councils, militias, etc., are responsible for the majority of assaults on women. It meant that a vast amount of what happened to women was ignored. When I joined Amnesty, and this was ignored in the way policy was constructed. So when I joined Amnesty in 2002, they had failed to determine any genocide had taken place in the 20th century. I'm talking about after the founding of Amnesty and after the, the broadening of the mandate that Isol talked about. Nor had they collected the kind of evidence that might have assisted a court in determining a genocide. Rape had been ignored in Bangladesh in 71, where the Pakistan army and its allied Islamist death squads had run torture centers and held women for rape. In former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, Amnesty had found no evidence of rape. A global campaign to stop violence against women, women, for which I was responsible as head of the gender unit, was supposed to address some of these lacunae. But as I described in two conversations, which should also come up in the chat, once women were subjects of human, were considered subjects of human rights, human rights lawyers fought hard to ensure that women's experience of violence did not sully the carefully constructed human rights norms around torture and terrorism. But the problem did not start with the war on terror. As Marie M.A. Ellie Lucas, who founded the network of women living under Muslim laws revealed, three women who were members of Amnesty Algeria asked that Amnesty reports on violence in Algeria did not only concentrate on state violence against Islamists, but also investigate Islamist violence against civilians. For raising this matter internally in very much the same language I used with Amnesty, they were expelled in the 1990s. And, th and that's why the admission that Amnesty had no problem with the key ideological, um, uh, the key ideology of Al Qaeda um, was such an important admission uh, to, to have achieved. Um, and, and, and I see that as a success of accountability. When Amnesty finally began to discuss a position on abortion, it was a victory that a policy position finally emerged after six years of discussion, which enabled Amnesty to oppose the criminalization of women having abortions. But the language was nowhere near a feminist position that women should have control over their bodies. So looking back, I was in successful in framing the argument as uh, the issue is an argument within hu the human rights movement rather than attack on the idea of human rights but i utterly failed to shift the culture of human rights organizations and the issues that i'm raising are um, far wider than amnesty international as i said at the time the tragedy here is that the necessary defense of the torture standard has been inexcusably allied to the political legitimization of individuals and organizations belonging to the Islamic right. It need not be like this, I wrote at the time. It is the majesty of human rights law that rights are inalienable and torture in particular admits of no exception. There is no need to massage the facts, sideline or denounce those who challenge them. There is no need to create a highly partial account, in effect, a narrative of innocence. But in opposing torture, Amnesty International and indeed Human Rights Watch, Reprieve, the Center for Constitutional Rights, and many other organizations around the world had deliberately failed to recognize that the victims they were defending could also be perpetrators. These views were seeded in organizations and donor foundations throughout the progressive world and affected their policies too, freezing out secular ad advocates, ex-Muslims, and anyone who challenged this warped but dominant version of human rights. As I watch recent events unfolding, the hounding of feminists, women losing jobs for speaking out, and the creation of a belief system where violent individuals are characterized as ultimate victims, 
I am in familiar territory. This is the rerun of a movie we have seen many times. For us, it may be a horror film, but for some viewers, it is a romance between a muscular, hard-edged human rights legal framework and the wispy floating signifiers of queer and gender theory, whose high priestess is Judith Butler and whose Bible is the Yogyakarta principles. But this romance is also a remake. By tortuous means, Butler's acolytes, the academic Sabah Mahmood and Humaira Iftikhar, uh, two Pakistani um, origin women, managed to drag, to use the drag queen example to, to exalt the piety of violent fundamentalist Muslim women and sanitize their organizations. I mean, this is really quite bizarre. And to find out how they did it, you'll have to read two other brilliant Pakistani women, Saadia Abbas and Afia Zaherbanu Zia, who have taken apart um, these narratives. So in my reading, the love of Islamism preceded the current ascendancy of a misogynist version uh, of pro-trans activism. But these are probably polyamorous circles and quite able to conduct several unlikely romances at the same time. And indeed, it's the same people within the human rights organizations who are promoting both these narratives. So queer theorists, many in gender studies departments, have been central to the attack on secularism and the idea of universal human rights. And this, of course, is curious, as they're simultaneously promoting their gender queer views globally. The accountability work that I have done since I left Amnesty, with several wins, is to do what feminists have always done. We have led and created our own campaigns, not waited for human rights organizations. So working with secular women's groups in the One Law for All campaign, we successfully used equality law to challenge discriminatory legal guidance produced by the Law Society uh, and, and guidance on gender segregation by Universities UK. Uh, by this, I mean sexual apartheid and very different from autonomous single sex spaces. We too fight against the existence of Sharia courts in this country, meaning the UK, and take up cases to ensure that Muslim women can access their rights. But the courts are very uncertain for her. And our clashes with the British government have taught me the problems we are up against are not only on the left. In my view, the Law Commission is bent on creating a kind of millet system, such as in the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, of, of uh, parallel uh, legal systems and strengthening the position of religious fundamentalists, damning women's rights and legitimizing Sharia courts. The government appointed review, and that is the Tory government, the uh, previous Tory government under May, into Sharia was so appalling that we were forced to boycott it. But we collected far more evidence of the harms of women's use of Sharia courts than the official inquiry did. So there is another movie that's also running in my head as I watch this unfolding drama. My challenge to Amnesty was on the ethics of partnering in what, and uh, so, and in effect, that, that movie is about what kind of buddy movie are we in? Who do we work with and what are our red lines? I'm alarmed at some of the discourse on gender, which fails to recognize the use of the word as feminists have classically used it to mean the social construction of roles and norms and behaviors of each sex. I don't believe that male violence or sex-based violence captures it entirely. Where the bonds of patriarchy have not loosened, women are often the prime perpetrators of violence against women or girls, often against their own daughters. And the language of gender-based violence has been used by women all over the world to mobilize and indeed inserted, it, inserted into the human rights framework uh, to, in order to insert the concerns of feminists we should not abandon it. Conversely, the term gender ideology is used by gender critical feminists, many of whom do not know that is also used in completely different ways by far right governments and by the Vatican to attack feminism, lesbians and gays and trans people um, in ways that we should all, if we oppose discrimination, be firmly against. These are not groups and people and organizations that we should in any way be allying with. And finally, on the issue of erasure of women, please spare thought for women all over the world who are not simply being linguistically erased, 
we work with women who are not only being stripped of their rights, but being murdered in large numbers, like the 85 girls who were killed in a school in, in Afghanistan, uh, for simply because they were girls accessing, accessing an education and because they came from the Hazara Shia minority. The kinds of issues that I deal with uh, in, in, um, in my work with the One Law for All campaign, uh, with the Center of Secular Space, which I founded, which is not a funded institute, but still exists as an idea with a loose co uh, coalition of women around it, um, and Feminist Dissent, uh, a journal on all kinds of religious fundamentalism, looks at these different kinds of religious fundamentalism and their connections with neoliberalism. For instance, the, the um, rape ideology that I described as central to defensive jihad has its counterpart uh, in the ideology of Hindutva, which I described in an article, Hindutva Past and Present, uh, where at the foundation uh, of this ideology of the Hindu far right uh, and of the, of the ruling party in India at the moment, um, the rape of Muslim women uh, is, uh, has been mobilized as a central uh, element of hate. Um, so when we talk about accountability, we really have to talk, I think, about the accountability that we have to each other as social movements, as activists and feminists, uh, as well as the people we are choosing to hold to account. If we do not guard ourselves, we cannot place the challenge to the human rights organization and others. We cannot ask them who will guard the guardian if we are incapable of guarding ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Gita, very much. Um, really powerful uh, contribution there. And I, one quote that really jumped out of me was the thing you said, where you said ignorance is not accidental, it is carefully nurtured. And I think that really opens up a discussion about the importance of women's presence in this in these realms in these organizations um, to make sure that you know these uncomfortable truths are not hidden that they're exposed and that they're they're confronted so thank you very much a lot to think about there um, and i know from the chat people really interested in what you had to say um, so we're going to move on to our third speaker now we're, we're delighted uh, to have kaisa ekis ekman here i'm just going to introduce you kaisa um, thank you for being here. Kaisa is a Swedish journalist, writer and activist. She is the author of several works about the financial crisis, critiques of capitalism and women's rights. Her book, Being and Being Bought, Prostitution, Surrogacy and the Split Self, has been translated into several languages and her latest book on the existence of sex, Thoughts on the New Definition of Women, has just been released in Sweden. Thank you very much for being here this evening, Kai. So we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm joining you from Spain where somebody's drumming on the street and my daughter is in the back. So if you hear a lot of noise, uh, I'm sorry about that. There's nothing I can do. So um, the big problem with NGOs, I would say, is the reputation. In most people's minds, uh, an NGO means uh, an independent organization working for human rights, i.e. the good guys. So when an NGO takes a stand in some question, people think this is the correct position. I mean, how many articles don't mention in passing that Human Rights Watch says, or you know, Venezuela say, uh, on Venezuela, or Amnesty says on Syria, and, and people don't know what is behind. How has this report been conducted? And that reputation in itself is why NGOs are so attractive to take over by vested interests and why they have been targeted by organized efforts since the 90s and pressured also into taking a stand on more and more issues that don't relate or are not relevant to their core goals. Um, this includes the geopolitical powers of the world. I mean, to have an NGO state, for example, that human rights abuses are going on in a country right before US invasion will take place. It is free war propaganda. It also includes economic interest, for example, when it comes to sex, to the sex industry, which I researched in my book. So since the 90s, the sex industry has been specifically targeted, uh, specifically targeting NGOs, both with efforts to obtain a favorable position on their issues and to receive funding. So much of this funding, as academic Jennifer Oriel has shown in her dissertation, 
was given as HIV AIDS prevention and ended up in the hands of the sex industry. So groups have been funded and founded and able to grow claiming they supported the rights of sex workers and helped prevent the spread of AIDS. When in reality, these rights were about uh, printing leaflets on the wonders of being a prostitute or a sex worker as they would put it. And prevention meant handing out condoms that buyers wouldn't use anyway as I was able to see with my own eyes in Barcelona when I was uh, doing research and visiting these centers that claim to help sex workers. Um, it has also been a problem with, for example, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that was going to stop the spread of HIV AIDS in India and ended up donating the money to pro-prostitution organizations, which the organization APNA AP were able to highlight and actually stop. Now in the 2000s, these groups uh, had gotten strong enough to start influencing global NGOs. And this is most notable uh, in the case of Amnesty International. So in 2015, after intense lobbying, Amnesty International took a stand arguing for the legalizing or as they would call it decriminalization, which basically amounts to the same thing, but the word has a more positive frame. Um, basically it means the same thing, uh, legalizing of buying sex and pimping. It was a formidable gift to the sex industry. Now it soon transpired that some of the organizations that Amnesty had consulted in order to revive at this position were headed by pimps. As Kat Barnyard showed in an amazing article, one of them, National um, uh, um, Network of Sex Work Projects, uh, NSWP, had a vice president, Alejandra Gil from Mexico, that had been jailed, that, that was jailed for 15 years for sex trafficking. So this organization uh, was quoted by Amnesty in their material uh, when they presented uh, their uh, new stand as decriminalization, advocating for the total decriminalization of anything related to sex work. This group um, was presented as being a sex worker network and is still presented so even after uh, the vice president has been jailed for 15 years for pimping. Jill was exploiting victims of trafficking by, says one victim, driving them to hotels with her son, charging them, writing down how long they took, which is classic pimping. Why do pimps write down how long it takes? Because they are worried that a prostituted person will do more than what is agreed and keep the money to herself. So any pimp will keep time, track the time, and make sure that you know, they don't stay too long with a customer or a buyer. Now, this was not a one-time mistake. Um, Norwegian section of Amnesty has been campaigning intensely against the country's law banning the projects of sex for a long time. So in 2016, uh, they released the report, um, the human cost of crushing the market, criminalization of sex work in Norway, uh, which was basically uh, putting down the whole law against the projects of sex, saying it was no good, it wasn't working, it had increased uh, violence against women in prostitution and so on. You know, the usual things that proponents of prostitution would say. Now, as Norwegian feminist Agneta Strem showed, this report was highly flawed. First of all, the title, um, the human cost of crushing the market, criminalization of sex work in Norway. Now, Norway has not criminalized sex work. Um, the Norwegian model is essentially the same as the Swedish model, which was introduced in 1999, which criminalizes the buying of sexual services and pimping, and which totally decriminalizes women in prostitution or anybody in prostitution. So basically, um, the Swedish model, which now is called equality model by some, uh, which has extended to Norway, um, France, and several other countries, um, essentially decriminalizes the people who sell sex more than, uh, for example, the German model. In the German model, um, the whole sex industry is legal, but it is illegal for uh, people in prostitution to, for example, be soliciting on the street outside a church, outside a school, or in certain areas, which they can be fined for. It is also mandatory for people in prostitution to register and to pay taxes. So um, the formulation of this, instead of actually focusing on the legislation in itself, which is about banning the purchase of women's bodies, 
This amnesty report pretends, even in the title, that Norway has criminalized sex work, which is totally untrue. Now, second thing, the material uh, that this report uh, is using uh, to show that to engage in sex work has become more violent in Norway, for example, is before dates to before 2009 when the law was passed. So basically they have been interviewing people in prostitution and academics on how it is to sell sex in Norway and use that material to show that th these experiences are because of the law, when in fact these experiences date from uh, years prior to the law. Third thing, um, this report was not an investigation. It was a collection of quotes from pro-prostitution academics. Um, four, there was no statistical evidence for the fact that violence has increased. In fact, this myth that violence against women in prostitution um, has increased because of laws against uh, the purchase of sex is a myth that is very efficient uh, because what it does is it avoids looking at the buyers of, of prostitution. It avoids looking at the pimps. And it basically reports that prostitution should exist and be legal for the women's sake. Now, the same thing has been stated in Sweden many times, also unfounded. Uh, when we evaluated um, our sex purchase law, it, uh, the report concluded there was no proof that violence should have increased because of the law. On the contrary, um, we have not had a single murder by a buyer or a pimp of a prostituted woman since the, since the middle of the 80s. Whereas in Holland, where prostitution is totally legal um, and the whole sex industry is, is, uh, is, is, is legalized and uh, basically owners of brothels are considered businessmen. Um, there are 13 women killed every year in prostitution. So despite this, the Amnesty Report um, kept on um, disseminating the myth that if you ban the purchase of sex, violence against women will increase. So the only way for men to stop beating up women in prostitution, and the only way for men to stop killing women in prostitution is to let men buy women in prostitution. Now, fifth point about that uh, report, it was a misrepresentation of victims' voices. As um, one trafficking victim that was quoted in this report complained, saying that, that her opinion that the sex purchase law, as it's called in Norway, was a good thing, was omitted from the report. Um, now, when it comes to Sweden, this is very interesting because, as many of you might know, the Swedish section of Amnesty International voted against um, uh, prostitution uh, being decriminalized. So also 2000 members of the Swedish section of Amnesty left Amnesty International, which was you know, the biggest drop in members that they've had um, in history. Many were appalled. And uh, you know, people were saying, well, writing letters to political prisoners is not the same thing as defending pimps, right? And uh, you know, also, you have to take into account that in Sweden, um, over 80% of the population support the, uh, supports the ban on the purchase of sex, uh, meaning that this law is kind of very anchored within the population itself, which might explain the fact that it was the Swedish section that voted against. But it's very interesting that even so, um, the head of women's rights in the Swedish section of amnesty seems to have very little understanding of the issue and has said numerous times that Sweden now should evaluate the law, which is said after the Norwegian report, uh, not seeming to know that we had evaluated the report just six years prior to that. Uh, I mean, should it be evaluated every year that somebody realizes we have this law? You know, and also her statements about banning, um, banning the purchase of sex mimic statements that have been done by Amnesty International. Um, saying that often laws can target the most vulnerable and so on, um, despite the fact that there's no evidence that the law has done so in Sweden. Now, in Amnesty's case, there could be an inbuilt bias. I don't know what uh, Isolt and Gita think who've been working within the organization. It could be so that there is an inbuilt bias against anything that has to do with police and laws, uh, and that the organization might be wired to regard such functions as oppressive which could explain why this fatalist idea that you know, any law will always target the most vulnerable or any law will just 
punish those who sell sex is so prevalent within amnesty. Uh, but amnesty has become politically active in many ways that I would say deviate from its original goals. Um, they have in Sweden joined forces with the national LGBTQ organization RFSL, um, demanding that changing sex should be simple and fast and a matter of self-identification, which they tweeted just a few days ago under the hashtag trans law now, um, which is also very curious because such a law um, basically making it possible for anyone to change sex without change, changing legal sex, that is, without any contact with uh, medical care or changing anything in the body, has nothing to do with trans people. Because I guess there are very few trans people who would actually want to change only the sex in their passport and do nothing about their bodies, when the reason for making it easier to change the sex which is stated in the passport is when a person that presents as a woman comes to an airport and has a passport that says he or she is a man, you know, it complicates things. But here you have a law which basically makes it possible for anybody who is bearded and presents as a man to have in his passport that he is a woman, which is not for trans people. This is a law that's made for other people, made it easier for other people to change sex. So this is again conflating the issues and attacking women's rights using hashtags and uh, ideas that relate to the trans movement when in fact this law is for everybody else. Um, we've had in Sweden the same problem with organizations such as RFSL and the sexuality organization RFSU, which have views both ranging from mildly positive to prostitution to openly campaigning for prostitution. And they have also released so-called reports where they are uh, bashing the Swedish law and saying it should be changed. Um, also, when I released my book um, a, a month ago on the new definition of sex, I saw somebody in the comments is um, asking what could be used instead of gender ideology. I don't use the term gender ideology just because as Gita was saying, I think this term is uh, highly contaminated by uh, extreme right-wing ideas. So in my book, um, I don't really have a good term as such, but in my book, I use the new definition of sex or the new theory of sex to highlight the fact that we're dealing with a whole set of ideologies, a whole theory around what is sex and gender, where essentially we see a reversal of the concept of sex and gender, where what we used to call sex, meaning um, what is just innate and what you're born with, um, and gender, which has been known as a social construct, are now reversed so that we're told we're born with our gender, our gender is innate, whereas your sex is a social construct and can be changed, uh, which essentially targets the feminist movement because we are hearing familiar ideas such as social construct, such as born with, you know, social critique, and we don't really realize that the concepts have been replaced so as to say we are born with our gender um, and basically our gender roles are, are innate. Now, this trans law that Amnesty Sweden is promoting is again a policy that has potentially harmful consequences for women, but no such consideration seems to be taking. Um, instead, Amnesty seems to be busy debating and attacking JK Rowling on Twitter. Um, for example, stating trans rights, human rights, six times in a row from their official Twitter account, um, using the classic rhetoric of repetition that is so characteristic of that movement. It seems like the more you say the same thing again and again and again, the more it's true. Um, when it comes to surrogacy, Amnesty does not have a position and neither do most NGOs. However, I was shocked when I attended a meeting in The Hague in 2018, where an international protocol on regulating surrogacy was being drafted, something like the Hague Convention on Adoption, which would give a green light to surrogacy all over the place. Um, present were NGOs and other organizations, such as Save the, the Children, Convention of Elimination of all, all Forms of Discrimination Against Women, WHO, the UN, all were active at that meeting uh, in drafting and regulating surrogacy without having a formal decision from the organizations on whether surrogacy should be allowed at all. And I kept asking those organizations, um, do you have a formal position on this? And they were all saying, no, we don't have a formal position, but yet there they were 
drafting a convention on surrogacy, which basically would give the green light to surrogacy, making countries who have signed um, those points uh, eligible for re reproductive tourism from, uh, from the West. Thanks, Kaisa. Are you able to wind up? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I have. <laughs> Thank like, you. Have sorry. <laughs> now, are we denouncing NGOs as a concept? Absolutely not. I would say some of them do very important work in many areas. I think what is important to acknowledge here is there has been a shift where some of them have been politicized against women. And I believe some of them have to be denounced publicly. Others have to be joined and changed from the inside because just as um, some people who are antithetical to women's rights have joined uh, the NGOs, uh, so we can do, and some of them, and join them as well to change from the inside. So uh, thank you. Um, that's all for me, from me for right now. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so I'm absolutely fascinated. All three of you, I could listen to um, for far longer than you had. So thank you for being so um, disciplined and, and kind of putting all that information into such short, really fascinating presentations. Thank you, Kaisa. Um, we're not letting you go just yet. We have got quite a lot of questions. We may not get through all of them. I'm just trying to group them to try and get at least some of them answered. Um, I think the gender ideology question has already become, uh, Kai, uh, Kaisa has already answered. There's some art suggestions in the chat, but Gita and Esau may have something they want to say about that. But we do have um, another question, which is to do with, well, there are two. One, one is about how people can in, interact as individuals within like Amnesty or, or, another, or another type of organization. Um, what can they actually do? I mean, people talked about the collectivization, but what can individuals do to influence policy? Um, and that links to another question we had about trade unions. Um, lots of trade unions are affili affiliated to Amnesty and they've got quite a lot of clout, quite a lot of money. So again, how can members of trade unions um, operate to ensure they're challenging their organisation? So something about how individuals can operate within their organisations to affect change that works for women, I guess, is the general question. Thank you. Um, shall I go to Esau first, because you've had a long rest? <laughs> Um, I, I suppose I think if you were trying to impact amnesty, it would be best going through, say, trade unions and stuff. So influence the trade unions because they have a bigger impact than an individual will on amnesty. When it comes to uh, my understanding with amnesty is when it comes to them deciding one of these campaigns, just as Keisha said, uh, it, there's literally no moving anywhere in it you know and, and to move it takes them so long to reach a decision because it's a membership organization and and they go through all these processes to get there uh you know individuals i don't think can really impact that very much but the way to do it would seem to me to be if there's uh, other large organizations that are affiliated to go that way for amnesty um thank you so gita do you have anything either on that or the get all the gender ideology what's a good term there are two sort of questions that are oh, sorry you're on mute Gita <laughs> I, I'm afraid I had to sort of uh you know that this I don't have an immediate term um mm -hmm. but I, I am wary of gender ideology because it is used in completely opposite ways by different groups of people um and I would as I said I would I would like feminists to go on using gender in the way we used to use it, which is about the social construction of of, of sex, you know, um, because without that, we we lose that distinction between the way people are born uh, and the way in which they are um, socialized. And that was a key understanding of feminism, various feminisms of the old days. Um, which has been completely lost, and I, I, you know, I don't think personally that it could just be re um, replaced by sex-based rights or other things. Not least because, as I said, women are always often um, the perpetrators. So no, I don't have an answer to that. But I think it's something we should discuss and discuss, you know, in 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 our groups and movements and so on. On the issue of how to influence NGOs, I mean, I, I agree with Kaisa that you can. It's, it's some NGOs and Am Amnesty is a membership movement. It can be influenced, but it's a long and thankless task. And you may decide that your time is far better spent getting on with the work 
than in uh, doing, and, and, and the ways of influencing are very similar to trade unions. You put forward motions, there are annual conferences, you, you know, there, there are, uh, apart from the trade unions, there, there used to be other networks. There used to be an LGBT network and a women's network and so on, and, and they fought uh, within Amnesty. Um, unlike the whole debate on abortion, which was a movement-wide debate. Um, so the good thing about it was that it was debated very widely. The very bad thing about it was that it, the terms of it were constantly narrowed uh, so that the, the position adopted eventually uh, was extremely conservative. The issue around sex work, and I'd like to be a devil's advocate for a moment over here, but the, the, the whole issue around that was not, as far as I know, because I'd left Amnesty by the time uh, they adopted that position. But as far as I know, it did not go through that same process of being debated. And where it was, it was, uh, as Kaiser has pointed out, a, 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 an issue that uh, really um, uh, was very, very internally divisive within Amnesty mm -hmm. and divisive within feminists in Amnesty, which is why I, for instance, would have, uh, insofar as I was involved with early debates around this, uh, was advising a lot of caution, saying don't rush into taking a position, don't, you know, we don't have to take a position on everything. Um, just relating a moment to what Isil says, that Amnesty had wind widened its brief uh, in many ways over the years, but it had done it through the demands of its membership um, and through a process of debate and adopting different positions. That was not, as far as I know, really gone through thoroughly in the whole um, decriminalization, prostitution, you know, using the language of sex work versus prostitution and so on. However, let me let me try and argue on Amnesty's side, as it were, for a moment. Um, I mean, without in the least, uh, you know, not disagreeing with the, the, the things, the facts that uh, guys have brought out. Um, they did they didn't, for instance, I don't think. I mean, I said, why don't we examine the Nordic model to see what's going on? Uh, there may be countries in which it works, but I can imagine countries in which it doesn't work. I think you're right, Kaisa, there was, and, I, and I'm one of them, there is a, an opposition to producing uh, 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 laws that immediately lead to criminalization. It's not an absolute opposition, because after all, we were talking about the criminalization of domestic violence, the criminalization of rape and marriage, uh, so there's many issues of criminalization within the violence against women framework, but there was a, a genuine divide and it, and it wasn't just about people who were involved with pimping or, or, or those organizations, but people who were very concerned. And I, I would be concerned about laws that depend on police intervention because the police are often the rapists. You know, we have a term called, called custodial rape in South Asia because it's the state that does the raping. And, um, uh, and, and women's shelters are often places where women are incarcerated without even a prison sentence, without a court hearing. They, they're not feminist shelters. And the international movement uh, against prostitution led in many cases that I knew of at the time that I was in Amnesty was the draining of funding from violence against women work run by feminists to funding for anti-trafficking centers, which were very closely connected with uh, forcing the women to either engage with court cases or to agree to basically be deported and return to their countries of origin, whether they wanted to or not. And the discussion that I would like to have from different wings of this movement is what do we do about that? What do we do about insecure migrant women that even the one shelter in, in Britain, there was a very good shelter for the women who entered it, from what I hear, and many of them did get leave to remain in this country. That shelter did only take women if they agreed to take part in a court process. That is against feminist principles, as far as I'm concerned. I, I think and, this, this is probably another a topic for another meeting, Gita. So yeah, but anyway, so I'm just sorry. saying that there's, there's a complex discussion around it where, uh, uh, you know, I can I can completely understand all the points, and and Kaisa's researched this. I don't I don't know uh, the reports that she's talking about. They're after my time. Uh, I I know it happened. I know there was an issue around it, but I can I can see reasons why one could argue on the other side, and I could also see reasons why there should be that discussion. And therefore, I'd say that um, 
there's been a recent piece of human rights um, language or a, a recommendation, recommendation 38 on CEDAW, which I think uh, the abolitionist lobby is very happy with because it was it was pointed out to me by the abolitionist lobby and which when I looked at the language, I was very happy with. And I think that's good drafting and that, you know, is a basis on which people can work together on those issues. Thank you, Gita. Sorry, to, it's just it's only because of time. It's fascinating to, hear, to have the discussion. Kaisa, did you want to come in? Thank you. Well, yeah, as you're saying, this is a long discussion to have, you know, when it comes to, you know, marginalized women, poverty and so on. I just want to quote Rachel Moran, who said, you know, if a woman's hungry, you put food in your mouth, not a dish. And, you know, I find it crazy that, you know, prostitution is the only form of sexual abuse that is legal in so many countries of the world, you know, that how can it be so that most countries, if not all, uh, ban rape? You're not supposed to have sex with a person who does not want to have sex with you. But if you bribe a person, then all of a sudden it's a whole industry, you know, that people are promoting and cheering. But I mean, as I usually say, if you ask any prostitutes, do you, I'll give you this money. Do you want to take this money and leave? or you can stay for the sex. I mean, I've never heard of a single one who would stay for the sex. So I think it's a huge problem that we have, you know, so many men having sex with women and children who don't want to have sex with them, you know, and that's a sexual abuse problem. It needs to be stopped and it, it should not be conflated with poverty, even though poverty is a big reason for the entry in prostitution, but it should not be seen as a solution to, to prostitution. Now, uh, if I may answer two of the questions that I've seen come up on the Q&A about what to call this ideology. Um, I wouldn't call it queer because the way I see queer, queer ideology is quite different from the new definition of sex. You know, queer ideology basically says there's no such thing as sex, everything is gender, everything is a social construct. Now this new definition says gender is innate, gender exists. If you think you are a woman, you are a woman. Whereas according to queer theory, you cannot be anything because everything you know, is, is, is arbitrary, right? So I think there is a shift here from you know, the women's movement, which said basically you know, we have sex and then we have gender to the queer movement that said, no, everything is gender all along. There's no such thing as sex, as sex. everything is a construct to the you know trans movement or new gender identity movement or whatever you want to call it that kind of theory that says gender is real gender is innate gender exists right and um yeah i think it's a difficult thing i was thinking when i wrote my book i was like debating with myself all the time what to call this what to call this you know i don't want to call it trans ideology because i essentially think it doesn't relate to trans people actually it's much bigger than that. It's a way to roll back women's rights all over the place. Um, it's basically a backlash against women. Um, I like the term female erasure, but it doesn't encompass everything. So, you know, lacking uh, a new term, I just called it, you know, the new theory of sex, which is not catchy. So this gender <laughs> borg, as somebody suggested, I think is much better. Can I just say quickly on that? I, I think we cannot continue to try and use gender the way the way that Gita wants to, because that's just gone now, right? And I think I wouldn't get too caught up. I don't use terms gender ideology or gender identity ideology. I think the most important thing is to find simple language to explain to all of the normal people out there who have literally no idea what's going on and what it means. And that's the real focus that we should be having is how do you simplify this? Uh, take it away from theories, explain it practically so people understand what the impacts are. Thank you. Thank you, Isol. Um, thank you. Well, I, I've got a hundred, I've actually I haven't got a hundred questions, but I've got a lot of questions. We're not going to get to them all. I'm just trying to pick something that I think is a bit different. And then um, maybe just the, I'll put that question. And I'm going to put another kind of closing question as well, which is more about how we debate. And I'm going to give you both of those questions now, if you don't mind, just because of time. So um, the question, one of the questions is, the focus has been on amnesty so far, but what about environmental organizations take on trans ideology? Why, why, why have there a lot of the environmental organizations taken up um, you know, the same position? And the bigger question was, um, it, it, was it's, it's, it says it's for Gita, but I think it's for all of us. Um, how do we find ways to openly discuss these things where they are genuinely held but irreconcilable 
uh, beliefs without people being branded bigots. So I know those are two sort of separate questions, but I'm chucking them both at you, both at you now in hoping that at least one or both of them will, will you know, will um, help you to come up, you know, will, will well, quickly, interest you. <laughs> quickly on the green and climate thing, I think that's simply a branding issue that it says that everybody's concerned about climate now, like no, no, you know, very few governments are going to get in unless they address climate issues. So green parties need something else. Their, their base is young, uh, LGBTQ plus whatever issues uh, fit with a young base. And I think that's why they've all adopted it. I think it's actually as simple as that, personally. Thank you. Um, did you want to say anything about how we have difficult discussions with, with people with differing positions? Or I mean, the question is I will, I'll quickly say, I think it's really, really important to be respectful and really try and listen uh, um, and, and to kind of continually model that. I, I, and, and, and I think it's really important to consistently fight for the notion that there needs to be space to have those discussions and that's what i keep trying to do uh with the whole chilling effect thing and um, but i think it's important to be respectful and to allow your positions to shift as well and to understand that each side are humans and and to remember the humanity of everybody thank you Isolt. kaisa um, on either or both of those questions about the, the environmental groups and also how we have difficult conversations with each other. Yes, I mean, we have the same problem here, you know, as a Marxist, I would say the problem is, you know, they don't have, they don't have, you know, basically the Green parties don't, are not based on an ideology or a theory as such. So it's very easy to be like to sway in different positions. So we have the same problem that our Minister of Equality is from the Green Party and basically is, is saying that people menstruate, you know, and women, what is that? And even participating in seminars about trans exclusive feminism um, without inviting anybody who, you know, is even considered by them such a feminist. So, you know, and I think it's, it's kind of interesting how, you know, particularly these positions as, you know, the Minister of Equality or the feminist organizations, it's like at the heart of the women's movement or at the heart of the positions that women have fought for their existence, that this new theory is taking hold, you know? So, so that's why it's so difficult to fight for, you know? In Sweden, they're speaking about now like the two front war. On one hand, we have to fight the extreme right and the patriarchal powers you know, fighting against women's rights, you know, trying to push back on abortion. And on the other hand, we have, you know, our internal fight basically taking place in our own organizations where we're being erased basically. So it's like a two front war. Thank you, Kaisa and Gita. I, I, um, I think they've handled the uh, green environmental, both both Isolt and Kaisa. So uh, I'm, I'm going to give some examples because I think um, they, they might help us to, to sort of think through how we can do this. So in India um, was one of many countries in which uh, homosexuality was criminalized. And it was criminalized uh, in a um, colonial era law uh, called Section 377 of the Criminal Code, they, which said um, that acts against the order of nature uh, should, you know, should, uh, you know, could be criminalized. Um, and so obviously the, the oh. lesbian and gay movement was fighting to axe this phrasing and get rid of section 377 uh, and, you know, decriminalize uh, same sex relations. Um, and the problem was, that this was the only law under which child abuse could be prosecuted because there were no specific laws that were about um, you know, sexual abuse of children, rape, sexual abuse of children. And it is horrific to imagine putting a child through having to prove that they did not consent to sex um, uh, you know, in the family or with whoever it was that was abusing them. So you have this completely, you know, immovable mountain and whatever object, you know, like, what do you do? You know, sex out of the bedroom and out of our personal lives, get the state off our backs. And the other one saying, no, we need to be able to prosecute abuse. Um, so anyway, there was a very, very um, difficult debate. 
But eventually what they decided, they put forward a notion, and this is what the court eventually adopted, was that they would read down the section. They would keep the section in place, but they would read it in such a manner that it did not c criminalize adult consensual same-sex relationships. And therefore it was still kept in place uh, in order to be able to prosecute um, other forms of abuse that would be difficult to prosecute. And I mean, the criminalization of homosexuality has gone back and forth in India, it was later recriminalized and then decriminalized again with a major judgment on privacy and so on. Uh, so, so, but it's been a long battle and it's been a battle in which different sides have had to come together and have these discussions. And some of these discussions are going on now about current issues along gender self ID and things like that, in which there are quite a range of positions. Uh, and which I have to say, I think some of my own friends and comrades, I think have got it wrong. They don't see a problem with gender self ID. I hope they're looking at what's happening around the world and they'll see differently. So I, but I think there are ways we can move forward. I think we can move forward with some of the good language in human rights documents to work on those things. Um, and, uh, you know, people sometimes say that these, these, diff these, these, fights are so difficult that we can't do anything. Uh, you know, we, 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 we have to work with anybody. We have to work with anybody who comes on our side and so on. And at the beginning, Issa looked at the really inspiring um, examples of her family, her grandfather and his mother and so on. And my parents were also situated in a similar struggle, which uh, took a lot of inspiration from the Irish struggle for freedom. Um, and the secular struggle itself, the British secular struggle, was rooted in, um, uh, well, a man called Charles Bradlaugh stood, uh, you know, argued against famine in India in the British Parliament, argued for Indian interests, stood for Irish home rule, stood for the rights of atheists to join Parliament without having swear to God. You know, the secular struggle itself has been uh, historically a very broad struggle about different freedoms. And my grandparents were also involved with that. So they were simultaneously fighting the British Empire, but that didn't mean that they felt they wanted to join the Nazis. They stood for um, against the persecution of Jews. When they went to America to lobby the Americans, my grandmother did, my father died in a, um, of, of his Indian imprisonment. My grandmother as a widow went to America to lobby the Americans to get them on the side of India against the British. But at the same time, stood with black Americans against the race laws because they understood it. They understood the position of Jews in Germany and black people in America from their own position as colonized subjects. So you can take on different struggles at different times and they do get better <laughs> from those, those relationships that are built up, even if they're difficult relationships. And I think that's what we have to strive for. Thank you, Gita. Those are really good words, actually, to draw our meeting to a close. And um, I know a lot of people are already saying that they're going to have to watch the whole meeting again because everybody said so much that they're going to need to actually watch it again to catch up with everything that's been said. So thank you so much. And you're absolutely right that we... we generally, but women in particular have always faced difficult fights and we've always uh, faced what looked like immovable mountains and um, we, we have never let that stop us for fighting for our rights or let that perturb us and we're not in, uh, we're not about to do that now and that, you know, I'm, I'm certain of that, the last few years in this struggle has really brought home to me and I'm sure many of us just, you know, if, if, if our rights are attacked, we will organise and we will come together and we will have those difficult conversations, even at personal cost, I know, in some cases. So um, thank you all three for being here tonight. Um, really, really fantastic contributions. We are going to have to go and listen to it again myself. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I want to also thank the backroom team. Uh, thank you. You don't see them, but they're beavering away behind the scenes to make everything look like um there's you know it's all straightforward and streamlined so thank you very much to the people behind the scenes and thank you to all of the people that attended here tonight um from all over the world you know these meetings are always an assembly of the global sisterhood um and it you know however miserable we feel or however down we feel when we come together like this and we realize that we are not alone 
um, then I think it really gives us the power and the strength to carry on. So thank you so much for coming. We'll get the film up as soon as we can. Um, thank you to Gita, thank you to Eastold, thank you to Kaisa for really incredible presentations this evening. Um, and we hope you have a lovely rest of the evening tonight, wherever you are. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.